thank, thank, thank God my daughter is not here. I think it's fair to say that the truth is intelligible, whatever the accent may be. The truth shines out clearly. And yet, we are in this absurd comic opera situation that Wafa described with Muslims being exempt from the full body scanners that they themselves made necessary because of a massive failure across the board to analyze the problem properly. The late presidential election showed both candidates speaking exclusively about the war on terror and not very often about it at all and explaining what they would do about it, framing the problem entirely in terms of difficulties in Iraq and Afghanistan and the possibilities of more planes flying into buildings or explosions taking place here or there. Neither candidate and no one else ever in the public square discussed the fact that the ideology that Wafa has so passionately and eloquently explained to us this morning is also advancing in the United States in many other ways. And our next speaker was for some time a senior analyst in the Pentagon who was aware of that dimension of the threat that we face and who was fearlessly explaining it and whose contract was not renewed for precisely doing just that. And so I now present to you Stephen Coughlin who is going to give you a digest of the exact presentation that he gave in the Pentagon that got him fired. And you will see here again that we are facing a very strange situation in which the truth is becoming forbidden to be told. And so we have to speak all the more loudly and insistently. Stephen Coughlin. Thank you. notes. <laughs> uh, I'd like to take a moment to, uh, to thank uh, everybody here. Um, this is my uh, big coming out, so um, I actually did write a note, and it, the sweat took it off. No, Pam, I'd like to thank you for having me here. Robert, I'd like to have, thank you for having me. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'd just like to point out, um, when we say truth, we can often talk about truth with a big T. And I think there is the question about the truth with a big T. Yeah, you've got, your mic is not speaking. Is this, is this better? Yeah. Got it. Um, we often like to talk about truth, and we like to talk about truth with a big T. And I, I, I would like to point out that, and I'm not, I'm all good with that, but I would also like to, like to talk about truth with a small T, just being factually accurate. Uh, at the end of the day, my biggest frustration has always been that I have always been able to win on the facts. What I'd like to do is take you through a little, little uh, tour. Now, the people who have seen me brief, when I tell you I could start now and go 18 hours straight without stopping, there are people here who can let you know I can go 18 hours straight. The deeper we go, the deeper I can take it, and you can't get past it, okay? So when I give a very quick snapshot on Islamic law, it'll be for the simple purpose of setting up the points to be made. Fair enough? Okay. So. Here's a couple questions, a couple scene setters I'd like to point out. I'm not asking anybody to believe what I say. My biggest frustration is a whole lot of decisions are based on what people choose to believe or not to believe. Rather, I'm pointing out that what I'm saying can be reduced to a series of issues of fact that can be resolved by a factual analysis. In talking about the requirement of a factual analysis, what I'd like to just basically say is all professional analysis is supposed to be fact-driven. Is that not true? So. What is clear is, even if you can show that what I'm about to prove or what I'm about to brief about the elements of Islamic law are untrue, I can still prove to you that I'm exactly wrong in exactly the way the terrorists are wrong when they are killing Americans. And that's okay with me because my job as an intelligence analyst was never to know true Islam. It was to define the doctrine the enemy fights in furtherance of. And if I did that, I was good. If we do that, we're good. Now. If the Islam is wrong, the, the, the Islamic law they quote is wrong, all that does is change the course of action we adopt, doesn't it? If he's right, it's a different court of ac course of action. But whatever it is they say they fight is why they fight. So how about a return to factual analysis? 
And by the way, when we do this, this is not hard anymore. To develop a threat doctrine, for us, all we ever had to do was look at books like this. And I'd like to point out that these books are all on Amazon. If you look at the Hedaya, right here, the Hedaya, I guess I can't walk away from that, can I? Uh, the Hedaya has, in book two, has book, has, has book 13, all 60 pages on jihad. One of these books, the CR, Shaibani CR, is the original book of Islamic law of warfare. That was published in 1955 in English. So what I'm trying to get here is all you ever had to do was start using Amazon to get the books that define what Islamic law say jihad is. And all I ask is that once you've validated the authenticity of those books as recognized Islamic law in the Islamic community, that should be the start point on which we assess whether or not terrorists have taken Islam out of context. Does that sound fair? I will argue, had we done that in 2001, we, wouldn't be, we would have been gone in 2003. The, the object of the enemy in the war on terror is to keep you from ever taking a direct look at undisputed Islamic law. So, our doctrine requires that we orient on the enemy stated threat doctrine. In this war, we actually have a self-identified enemy who actually has told us what his threat doctrine is. Can one be both politically correct and threat focused in this war? So, a couple questions. When national security leaders, decision makers, and analysts say that political correctness gets in the way of their doing their job, aren't they admitting that they put conformance to the postmodern narrative? ahead of their oaths to protect and defend the Constitution against all enemies. And I mean enemies, not violent extremists. I don't even know what that means. Similarly, when statements are made like, we in the West have a tradition of not looking to religion, is that also not an admission that they conform to the postmodern narrative by not orienting on the self-identified enemy, self-identified doctrine, and then branded it a virtue? Think about that. So, here's what I want to do. If there's just one concept of Islamic law that I'd like to hit today, and it's the only, it's, there's actually going to be two, but this is the only one I'll, I'll build out a little bit. It's this concept of abrogation. And I'm going to give you a top-level understanding to it because it's the, I think it's, if there's one thing to know, this is it. And I'll quote right out of Islamic law. The law was laid down in the period of the prophet gradually and in stages. The aim was to bring society's deep in morality to observe the highest standards of morality. This could not be done abruptly. It was done in stages, and doing so necessitated repeal and abrogation of certain laws. Now, does that not completely change your understanding of the war on terror? No. Well, who brought the law to Muhammad over a period of years? Allah, over 22 years. And what this statement of Islamic law is saying is that when it was brought to Muhammad, it was done gradually and in stages. And later, when Allah revealed something that contradicted something said earlier, it abrogated what was said earlier. Make, make sense? But that would mean that when we say those radicals are cherry picking from the chronological back of the Quran, if this statement of Islamic law is true, then that would be true, wouldn't it? You ought to be cherry picking. So, why abrogation today? Because I will argue that you cannot understand Al Qaeda, the Muslim Brotherhood, Hizbut al Tahrir, if you don't understand this concept. Let's take a look at the milestones from Syed Qutb. He's a seminal thinker in the Muslim Brotherhood. He died in 1966. He said, the Quran did not come down all at once. Rather, it came down according to the needs of the Islamic society and facing new problems. Doesn't that look pretty close to what the Islamic law book says? So, he then quotes the Quran, and we'll get to it later. It's 17106. But now, what happened with Said Qutb? Muslim Brotherhood in the 60s was very, very, very concerned about the fact that they thought that Islam had sunken into a state of disbelief. Jahiliya. And the question was, how do we bring Islam back to its, its, its prior greatness? How do we do that? And he concluded that the best way to do that was to emulate how Islam was brought to the first generation, the best generation. So the whole idea for the Muslim Brotherhood was to bring Islam back to today's Muslim community and then to the world in the same way over a period of 20 years of revelation or however long it takes. And then when they hit a milestone, when they, looked and saw, when they looked at the community today and saw they reached a point, and it matched a point in the first revelation where they hit a milestone, milestones, then they would change the message and they would, they would go back to this whole concept of uh, going to a new stage, because it's re revealed gradually in stages. 
So milestones is about marking the stages. Sound, sound good? Now, you don't have to take my word for it that this concept, I will say, you cannot understand radical Islam if you don't understand Syed Qutb's milestones, and you can't understand milestones if you don't understand abrogation. Don't take my word for it. Here's Ayman Zawari. What does he say in his book? Syed Qutb's call for loyalty to God's oneness and, and to the knowledge of God's sole authority and sovereignty was the spark that ignited the Islamic revolution. It's good enough for me. So, here's what the Quran says in 17106. It is a Quran which we have divided into parts from time to time in order that thou mightest recite it to men at intervals. We have revealed it in stages. And the commentator to the Quran says this is progressive revelation. What Major Hassan said in his brief that he gave to his fellow students in Bethesda was that the reason he's asking is because when the Quran was revealed, there's progressive revelation and it has to do with abrogation. You see that slide? Does everybody see that? Okay. So, the Quran went on to say, my brief went, when we substitute one revelation for another and Allah knows best what he reveals in stages, they say thou art but a forger. And of course, the commentator again said, this is the Islamic concept of progressive revelation. And a final quote, none of our revelations do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, but we substitute something similar or better. Knowest thou not that Allah hath power over all things? And what did Major Hassan say in his brief? None of our revelations do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten. When we substitute one revelation for another, I like to think that I got it right in the Pentagon. So, the literal meaning is the nasc or the cancer or transferring its technical sense. It is used to mean the lifting of a legal rule through a legal evidence. The abrogating text is called the nasik, while the repealed is called the mansuk. And what did uh, Hassan say? In Mecca, Muslims were not permitted to defend themselves. Emigration to Medina and self-defense was allowed. Then offensive fighting was allowed. Later verses abrogated formerly peaceful verses. So how many people think understanding abrogation is maybe a key to understanding the whole radical narrative? In fact, it's the key without which you can't go anywhere. How many people do you think understand this concept when they analyze the enemy in the war on terror? So, let's just give one quick example. This is Islamic law, quoting the Tasfir Ibn Kathir, and here's how it works. It's a quote from the Quran, Surah 262, verse 262. Surely those who believe, those are the Jewry, the Christians, and the Sabians, whoever has faith in Allah on the last day and works righteousness, their wage awaits them with their Lord, and no fear shall be upon them, and neither shall they sorrow. Well, Ibn Kathir wanted to explain that. As you can see in the Islamic law book, it's called the abrogation of previously real religions. And what does it say? It says, the faith of the Jews is that whoever adhere to the Torah and the Sunnah of Moses, a Muslim prophet, until the coming of Jesus a Muslim prophet. When Jesus came, whoever held fast to the Torah and Sunnah of Moses without giving them up and following Jesus was lost. The faith of the Christians was that whoever adhered to the evangel and precepts of Jesus, their faith was valid and acceptable until the coming of Muhammad. Those of them who did not then follow Muhammad and give up the Sunnah of Jesus and the evangel were lost. Why? Well, because Surah 2 was abrogated when Allah revealed in verse 385 Whoever seeks a religion other than Islam will never have it accepted of him. This is divinely revealed. So that would mean, according to abrogation, that the peaceful verse, we can all get along verse, was abrogated. Fair? We could certainly quote Islamic law to show that. So if I'm wrong about the Islamic law the radicals fight for, I'm wrong because I'm reading the exact books they're reading when they walked away with an erroneous understanding of this. So, here. Why is that important? Because what Hassan wanted to point out to people is two different paths to heaven, 262 was abrogated by 385. So, this is what the Quran looks like when you arrange it chronologically. I'll say in due diligence, because people say, Steve, I don't agree that's the order. I think Robert Spencer would argue that Surah 9 is the last. Other people will argue that 110 is the last. What you need to know is that everything said here will overrule everything said here in the Quran. Fair enough? Yeah. And everything set up here can be, everything set down here controls whatever's set up here. And there's complete agreement, you correct me if I'm wrong, can everybody hear me? No. Oh, <laughs> that while some people think that 9 was the last verse and some people think 110 is the last verse, there's pretty much universal agreement that 2 is the beginning of the Medina period, 3 came after 2, and 9 is the last to talk about jihad, and 5 is the last to talk about relations with non-Muslims. 
So it really doesn't matter whose ordering you take. This is pretty much settled, isn't it? Absolutely. Okay, according to Islamic texts. So we have whoever seeks religion other than Islam will never have it accepted of him. Well, because that's true, the last verse on the last verse to talk about uh, jihad says, "Fight and slay the unbelievers wherever you find them, and lie in wait for them in every stratagem of war." And then it goes. That's Surah nine, verse five. And then you have. Fight those who do not believe in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been by Allah and his apostle, nor acknowledge the religion of truth until, even if they are people of the book, that's Christians and Jews, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So why is that important? Because Hassan said, this is what we're supposed to do. There's the sword verse right there. And what else did he say? He quoted the prophet Muhammad, quoting the second most authoritative Hadith scholar, where Muhammad, when someone asked him, said, hey, because, because Allah said we must fight them until they testify, I have to tell you that I have been commanded to fight them until they testify. And if Muhammad, the most perfect Muslim, was commanded to fight them until they testify, you can easily extrapolate without having me to go into it that Islam has been commanded to fight them until they testify. I will submit to you that there is no factual legal analysis of Islamic law that can get you to any other conclusion, which is why there's a huge effort to keep you from ever reading Islamic law straight. What else did he say? He quoted the offensive jihad continued. I really do like to think I got this right. Warning was provide, provided in my briefs about exactly the threat that would come from somebody who wanted to become a jihadi. On the doctrinal driver that jihadis like Major Hassan will orient on as the basis to act. Do you think it's fair to say that it's nailed? Okay, so his conclusions. God expects full loyalty and promises of heaven. Moses may be seen as moderate, but God is not. And then you have in quotes because it's not an approved thing. I love the Quran and, and being a Muslim, but I don't want to live under Islamic rule. Because he went on and says, says, fighting to establish an Islamic state to please God, even if by force is condoned by Islam's, Islam. Muslim soldiers should, be, should not serve in any capacity that renders them at risk to hurting or killing believers unjustly. And of course, he quoted the Quran. This is what people were saying. He took Islam out of context. Tell me who Hassan is. Maybe not everybody. Everybody know who I'm talking about with Major Hassan? Okay. The Fort Hood Killer. I am sorry. I should have said that. And these are the slides that you could get right on the web for what he was briefing. So do you see this? And do not kill anyone whose killing Allah has forbidden. So when he said that, you tell me where he. I mean, you could come. I'm not saying it, it closes the book on it. But it's not exactly like he, he, that's not in the Quran. And it's not exactly like that doesn't say exactly what it says. I kind of think his whole argument patterns exactly. I was asked, did he ever see my brief? I've never met the guy. How could he do exactly what you're doing? Because this is undisputed Islamic law. And let me, full disclosure, Sunni Islamic law. So, what did he recommend? As opposed to Shiite. He, his recommendation, does this sound like a threat? Department of Defense should allow Muslim soldiers the option of being released as conscientious objectors to increase troop morale and decrease adverse events. Now, some of you might not agree, you know, that's, you could take it either way. But, you know, it's one of those, it's all about what the word is, is. You see, he has the about decreasing adverse events, that does that last sentence. Well, to understand what he means, you would go to the slide he titled Adverse Events, and he said adverse events was killing other soldiers. I truly believe that this briefing was him announcing that he's a jihadi to the people there with the full knowledge that because nobody's ever researched the topic, he could look someone right in the face and say, I'm a declared jihadi because he has to declare to become a shahid if he dies, right? Okay? and know that nobody will understand what he said. So, here, protecting the force, the Foot Hood Report. Let's take the word, we did a word search, I did one. Violent extremist zero, enemy zero, Al-Qaeda zero, religious, 59 times, Muslim Brotherhood Ikhwan, zero, Jihad, Takfir, Salafi, Islam, Muslim, Hamas, Hezbollah, Caliph, Sharia, zero. I have to do full disclosure. I have asterisks right there. They did quote an article called Countering Violent, Extrema Countering Violent Islamic Extremism. It's the only place it showed up. So, 
Not even the PC replacement term for terrorism was given any recognition here. By the way, the PC t the, that's a PC term that replaces the PC term, excuse me, the term terrorism. I mean, jihadi. Excuse me, I kind of stepped on myself. Who controls the information battle space here? Who is in command of the information domain on which we fight the war on terror? So, this is very real, okay? This is an article that came out of Pajamas Media. And what I want to point out, it did not come into any mainstream media. What does it say? Here's this Christian Action Network, and the, gover the state of Maine sent them a fine of $4,000 sent it in the mail. And what was it about? The group in question, the Christian Action Network, received notice of the fines and a fundraising ban in May 6 on a letter from the, uh, the Maine's Department of Professional Financial Regulation. Enclosed in the letter was an, a prepared consent agreement for CAN to sign agreeing to all the state's allegations, waiving all rights to appeal, and agreeing to pay the $4,000 fine. As part of the consent agreement, can is required to agree to all of the state's allegations, including their assertion that their mailing amounted to hate speech. Now, if you understand what the video was about, it was about terrorism, homegrown jihad. They didn't even get served to come to a court and defend it. So this whole thing about attacking speech, just like, let's take a look. Do we not have total blank out there? So. Let's wind it down by going to a question. This is America. Let's just do this mental exercise. Am I good for it? A couple, oh, five yeah, minutes? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go Let's just do this mental exercise. Is there something underneath all this PC? Is there something just a little bit more than just, oh, it's political correctness? If the U.S. government were to submit to Islamic law, I would, I would, I would suggest that it might be this Islamic concept of slander. And that's just, just an exercise, but let's just see where we can go with it. Uh, by the way, slander is identified in Islamic law. Now, I just want to go through one slide to give you a proper framing of it. There's tons of the stuff on the Islamic concept of slander. And what does it say? The reality of tail-bearing lies in divulging a secret and revealing something confidential whose disclosure is resented. A person should not speak of anything he notices about people besides that which benefits a Muslim. So the Islamic definition... The Islamic definition of slander, the legal definition, and I could get 15 others, and there's people who've seen me brief, believe me, I can tell you, I can stack up 15 of these, this is not going to be taken out of context, is that slander is to say anything that doesn't benefit Islam. So, what's the standard? Well, here's the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Conference, it was just referred to a couple minutes ago. And what do we have here? It's, an, it's a summit. So you should know that summits are attended by all the heads of state. So when this was passed by the 57 member states, you could basically understand that this was at the head of state level that this 10-year plan was approved in 2005. And what is the goal? Endeavor to have the United Nations adopt an interpretation, an international resolution to counter Islamophobia and to call upon all states to enact laws to counter it, including deterrent punishment. That means to get the United States, it means to get the Netherlands, it means to get Austria to pass laws to make defamation of Islam a crime in their countries. Now, I will tell you that, is, that the passage of that law would be a catastrophic assault on the First Amendment. And there's no two ways about it. By the way, the same Article 6 that says this Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land is the same Article 6 that requires that everybody take an oath to protect and defend that Constitution. So, here we have summits our head of states. I just want to show you something, just to make sure that I know the current uh, person being recommended for the envoy to OIC is in trouble. But when it was first picked under the Bush administration, it was Sauter Cumber. And what did he say? I looked at the 10-year plan and I thought, oh my goodness, I think the Muslim values they are aspiring here are exactly in sync with American values. <laughs> well, this was the formal representative from the last administration. So, there is a 10-year plan here. Let's remember that Islamic doctrine of slander. Respect for religions is under the combating Islamophobia section of this, okay? There it is. 
And this is a demand that the West implement Sharia crime and punishment against constitutionally protected free speech. There is no other way around it. So, that be us. Exactly in sync with American values. So, this is real. It is irrelevant whether Wilder's witnesses might prove Wilder's observations to be correct, the Dutch prosec pr prosecution said. What's relevant is his observations are illegal. <laughs> Think about what that means that a prosecutor in a Western world, in the Western world, can say that and not get fired. <laughs> by prosecuting, by, 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 but, but the prosecutor said that ex expressing his opinion in the media or through other channels is not a part of a member of parliament's duties. Holy cow. You're talking about a powerful man. He is in charge of the second biggest party in the Netherlands. And they can do that? This is an enumerated hu human right. In fact, it's Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And this is walking on it. So, and you see this? It's all in it's all, on, it's all on the internet. Where is the mainstream media? It's not just really an assault on speech. Listen to what that prosecutor said. It is an assault on thought. Okay? So. You know, the problem when I do this like for about 12 hours straight, because people won't let me go, is I, I, I will, like about the sixth hour, I'll start getting so angry, I start you know, spitting or something like this. I'm a lawyer by tra training. I mean, my God, you know. So here's my question. We had that definition of slander in law. We saw that the OIC has got a 10-year plan to impose that, okay? Is associating Islamic motivated acts of terrorism with terrorism considered slander? I have to reword that. Under the de definition of slander under Islamic law is associating Islamic acts of terrorism, meaning those acts of terrorism which positively can be associated with people who said they did it in the name of Islam, is it slander to talk about that under that definition? So if you respect that law, you cannot define the enemy. Do you see how they plan to win the war? You think that we're fighting a war over there? I think they're fighting a war right here, okay? And I think they got what they are looking for. Is it that hard to believe that you could have an enemy that's willing to lose every tactical engagement if in exchange they retain strategic, the strategic picture for you? Think about that. So, let's see this. Here's MPAC. What did they say when they're asked to comment on the 9-11 Commission? Terminology is important to defining our goals as well as removing roadblocks into hearts and minds. You bet. The 9-11 Commission identifies Islamist terrorism as the threat. The Muslim Public Affairs Council recommends that the United U.S. government find other terminology. Okay, so I will say that this was MPAC. This is an overt call to reject the 9-11 Commission's findings by replacing 9-11 terminology with, ones that, with one that is subordinated to its narrative. I believe that we're fighting the entire war on terror on narratives. And when we shifted the entire war on terror to fighting the war on terror based on narratives, we went off the factual template. Okay? You see, the Constitution says we protect and defend against all enemies. The postmodern narrative says we fight and and protect against all violent extremists. Think about that. Because, you know, that word gets to mean anything you want it to mean. So long as it's not enemy. So, let's take a look at this. The law is slander. The enforcers are the OIC and MPAC. Let's see what happens. So, there's the standard. MPAC was demanding that the 9-11 Commission change its language. And here, the 9-11 Commission. Violent Extremism 3, Enemy 39, Jihad 126, Muslim 145, Islam 322, Takfir 1, Muslim Brotherhood 5, 
uh, religious 65, Hamas 4, Hezbollah 4, Al-Qaeda 36, Caliph 7, and Sharia 2. Okay? So, the 2009 National Intelligence Strategy Unclassified that came out in August 2009, and the FBI lexicon that came out in 2008. Violent extremism, 29 and 9, enemy 0, jihad 0, Muslim 0, Islam 0, Takfir 0, Muslim Brotherhood 0, religious 3 and 1, Hamas 0, Hezbollah 0, Al-Qaeda 0 and 1. And by the way, when the, uh, na the uh, National Intelligence Strategy uses the word Al-Qaeda, it is to say one example of violent extremism is Al-Qaeda when they use uh, violent extremist practices. Okay? Um, Khalif and Sharia. So when you're fighting hearts and minds in Afghanistan and you don't have reference to that language, who are you talking about? And how can you define a hearts and minds in Afghanistan that doesn't even have a lexicon that admits this language? You know what I call this? Complete 9-11 Commission has been completely undermined. The facts, the facts and the factual content of the 9-11 Commission has been completely undermined. This is decisive victory in the information battle space. The destruction of factual analysis by the removal of words that define. Supplanted by an illusion of knowledge where none exists. So, you starting to see a, a pattern here? Because I will tell you, if I can, it's just this simple. You cannot defeat an enemy you're not allowed to define. How, how can this report have anything to do with Major Hassan? How can it? By the way, I'll go with my line, TikTok. At what point, you know what this is about? This is about the... Uh, Five people who, the story's coming out back in December, were being arrested for poisoning the uh, troops' food supply at Fort Hood, I mean Fort Jackson. So, that one minute? Yeah. When I wrote a thesis on this, the cost of not understanding the enemy has been high and is getting higher every day. It will increasingly be measured by news stories that narrow in on senior leaders' inability to answer basic questions about the nature of the enemy, it will also manifest itself in official responses to terrorist attacks that become progressively less reality-based. Political correctness can not only be a cause for losing a war, but a strategy to defeat the United States could actually be premised on making it too politically correct to define him. I believe that the enemy plans to win the war in the information battle space. That would be Islamic law of jihad doctrine going all the way back to the 7th century. It would be what Ayman Zawari said when he said 85% of this war is in the information domain. Again, it's just this simple. You cannot have a strategy to defeat an enemy you will not define. I know we don't have a strategy if I know they will not define the enemy. And so does the enemy know that. Thank you.